Welcome to the Human Conversation Podcast with Jules White, the real dragon slayer, author and entrepreneur sales coach. Tune in weekly for human conversation about business and sales. Enjoy business expert interviews, educational episodes, and virtual cuppers with entrepreneur business owners. So grab yourself a cuppa and enjoy. Here is your host, Jules White. Welcome to the Human Conversation. And I am always excited about my guests, but particularly this time, I've got Toby Moore with me. And he is just wonderful. And we're going to obviously let you listeners know why he's so wonderful over the next half an hour or so. But um, I've, I've known Toby since probably 2018, I would say, was when we properly met at Helen Packham's event. EL Live all those years ago. Can you believe that? Six years, Toby? It's almost a million years. Isn't it? Isn't it just? But we're going to have an amazing human conversation today. Uh, Toby does lots of very exciting things. He's the most wonderful character. I must just tell you before we start talking that Toby was on my podcast in 2019 And he was episode 48. So I've been doing my 10,000 steps a day for cancer research through March. This is when we're recording it right now. And this morning I listened to that episode back, Toby. It was so fun finding out all about where you started, finding out about the content club and just all the lovely things you've been doing and a little bit about TEDx. If you want to listen to that, that's episode 48. Have a listen it's pre-COVID, so it's also quite interesting how we talked about things. But today, I want to just dig into catching up with my amazing friend, because I haven't seen him and spoken to him for some time. And we've also got TEDx Brighton coming up, and we'll tell you more about that as we go. And that is on April the 5th down in the Brighton Dome so this will be going out just before that and so I'm going I can't wait I'm going to be in the audience Um, and having been a speaker that's a real treat to actually be able to just sit and watch you know so Toby um, just tell us a little bit about you you know for the listeners you you haven't met any of them so so tell me (laughs) about Toby you know ah hello Jules Uh, (laughs) thank you for having me back it's lovely (laughs) always a pleasure well I'm Toby more um I um I I just make things for a living right I'm a I'm a professional maker gardener noodler um and um yeah I I I sort of pride myself on my ability to to sort of pick up things and put them down and, and play and and so on so um, much like you alluded to, TEDx is a big part of my life. So I've been curating and directing TEDx Brighton for seven or eight years now, and been a part of that project for for over ten. So I've I don't I've, I I don't own clothes uh, that I've had that long. I haven't had a girlfriend for that long. It's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely I love, I love that. I, love. I haven't had a girlfriend for that long. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, much like Jules as well, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a writer and an author. This is my book, Make It. Um, yes. That, how to work with clarity, creativity, and confidence, or some of those some of those words in different orders. Um, and um, and I, I I made the transition out of sort of the marketing world a few years ago and into the more kind of ambiguous creative consulting world. And um, so now I just kind of like jump from project to project just trying to implement more creative work wherever I go. And I do that in a sort of corporate brand building setting. And I do it in a charitable setting as well with the various charities that I work with, that mostly youth youth charities. And uh, and just as at this point in time, I'm just in the process of launching two new businesses as well. One's an events-based business, which is kind of like the evolution of TEDx Brighton. And one's a brand building business, which is more focused on kind of uh, creating harmony you know around earth and space and things like that um Amazing. and uh, and just because it's by my side at the moment I'll share one little uh, side quest that I'm doing at the moment. me and my 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 girlfriend that I've had for less than 10 years uh, we're both <laughs> board games at the moment so um so we've got um what's the one I've got here we've got this space game so this is our little side hustle so we're building these like card games and you build like space universes and things and then you 
navigate them with little rockets and you collect space gems as you go and yeah so we're our fourth game now and we're sort of <gasps> having to work out what the business model is and all of that sort of that's thing that's so cool look wait let's yeah. stop 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 because i want to know about this this is just <laughs> incredible so so obviously if you followed me you know i went into dragons den way way back in 2005 and actually historically there's been a few games board games gone into the den toby and and pitched so that's um that's it's a market that is most definitely yeah. an interesting and market. board games for a long time now have been the most funded projects on things like kickstarter and stuff like that so that they're, yeah. they're, they're um and we've learned just by sort of because we were just making games because we wanted something to do other than watching tv you know and we found a we just accidentally found a gap in the market for two-player games that, that that have a certain dynamic to them so so we just started making our own and then we started looking at kind of like, well, what does the market look like for this? And it's very saturated. Yeah. yeah there's a lot of people that the, 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 the homemade games market is a market into itself. And there's a lot of like, you know, even the, in the sort of sleepy seaside town that I live in, there's three board games, shops and cafes, you know, so. Oh, wow. um, and they have like bring your own, you know, homemade games nights and stuff like that. So it's a big thing. Um yeah. But we're trying to, yeah, we've, we've stumbled across a business model that we like that, that that sort of like operates outside the whole kind of like, you know, make a thousand games and flog them on Amazon or whatever. So Yeah, I like the idea of having a game that's for two people as well, because often, yeah. you know, games don't work so well for two because you yeah. need those multiple players. So yeah. I really like that concept. You know, two thirds of the games that we find are three players and up. And yeah. uh, so we found a little niche. Obviously, well, that's what we're here to talk about. Well, I don't know what we're here to talk about today. Well, Maybe it's this. Wait, this is the thing you see this is where the human conversation might, takes us quest, in a year's time this might be my life do you know what I mean I know you're going to be a, this multi-millionaire game producer you know and, and it all started on a human conversation podcast yeah, right, you know right. um but listen I I love the idea of of the things you do I I love your creativity when we podcast last time there was these really poignant moments when we had our conversation where you said I actually just want to show off as me I, I want to be disruptive <clears throat> because there was a lovely story you told me about a guy that you'd worked with I think in the corporate world who had said Toby why do you wear trainers to work uh, do you remember this story yeah, yeah. tell us that story just really briefly. Uh, yeah, uh, really yeah. It's, it's in the book so it's solidified in my mind <laughs> yeah it was um yeah I, I used to work for this big corporate FTSE 100 company and there was this there was this graduate scheme and there was this young guy that, that could, you know and it was there was a quite a tight dress code that obviously I paid no attention to and um yeah and the young guy came up to me and he was just like oh Toby why why do you wear trainers to work and like you know I think on a normal day you'd just be like I feel like wearing trainers whatever but I, I what did I say I turned around and I said oh I it it's uh it's so I can remind people that they can't tell me what to do yes you know, it feels like a pretty Toby thing to say, to be honest. But then what he said was sort of blew my mind, which is like, yeah, but Toby, what if you want people to tell you what to do? <laughs> well, at that point in time, I can't help you. There's nothing I, there's nothing I have to offer. You said, like You said I uh, have no words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not everybody sort of values this freedom or maybe, you know, you know, has discovered the value of freedom yet. I mean, well, it, well, exactly that, exactly that. But that kind of sums up, I think, like where you've sort of come from is this just being able to express yourself in the way you want to and creating something like the games yeah. you've mentioned. You know, it's well, another dimension of it. In between you. this conversation and our last conversation, one of the things I spent doing is 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 I, I sort of became head of department at, at a music college for a while. And I was head of entrepreneurship at this music college for about two years. And um and a big part of that work is like working with artists and musicians and helping them realize that kind of like there's this dynamic which is like creating as yourself and creating for an audience. And um and a lot of them believe that it's a, a balance that you have to keep, you know, you have to sort of like create for an audience and be commercially, you know, viable and stuff. But then you also have to have outlets for your own creative work and and the big philosophy of the of the college itself. And also the thing, you know, that my, you know, my work was a part of championing is just like, no, you create as yourself. 
and you and you and you go and find the audience for that work or you wait for that audience to find you it's not about responding to trends and so on because that takes you in a direction which might seem like it has a predictable sort of like commercial framework to it um, but it's unsustainable at a personal level and and the amount that you have to give up in order to sustain that journey is is you know for you know and you know you always see outliers in that and you know and the people the pop stars that we see on stage and the famous actors and stuff you know they are the you know the 0.1 percent of these industries mm. and they're not the best sort of people to sort of build your own predictable framework of a creative career on yeah. um and and i really sort of the 99.9 percent of of any creative industry is really built on people going this is what i make and i really love it and i'm really proud of it and i want to share it and i want to find the audience that will connect with it yeah. you know and it's that classic kind of cliche like if you can find one person like that's a proof <laughs> <laughs> that there's people out there you know and, and your yes. job is just to keep creating keep creating keep being authentic until you find the people that connect with your work and want and want to be a part of that journey I've got a question around that because when you think about the old days which I'm going to call them Toby and you're not as old as me uh, when if you made music you needed to go to a record producer mm. and they had to choose you and then they marketed you you know mm. that was the process today you've got things like your Spotify platforms etc we were restricted by the fact that the big producers chose what music we all listened to whereas now I think whilst you've got to find it do you feel like we have a more diverse pool of music that we can now listen to that's always going to be the case and you know there's there's more music and content uploaded to the internet every day than any one of us could listen to in our lifetime so like you know we have this saturation of content but mm -hmm. that's not really the problem as I see it like the actual diversification that's happening is this convergence between product service and content so and and brand and and when you just talk to musicians about that that's a slightly sticky thing for them to get a head around because they know that they need to play the rules of the industry or whatever but at the same time they want to go and be their own thing and they don't want to do they don't want to subscribe to the labels if you talk to musicians about product they get a bit like Bleh, you know whereas whereas really it's kind of like no own it redefine what that means to you mm -hmm. and and music used to be a product you know yes. something bought in a shop it's something that you you know that you that you listen to at home and you bought records and you listen to music videos and stuff Whereas now music is more like content and marketing to you and it, and for, for something else. And the product is you and and your service is your ability to create community and serve that community. So you see the 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 the, the artists that, that 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 do well now, particularly artists that retain agency and ownership over their work and don't go through labels and distributors and stuff. Are the ones where their monetization comes through community membership you know in the same way that we see many of our business models working as sort of personal brands it's exactly yeah. the same as musicians yeah. and then they can create in the same way that we might organize a conference or a round table they'll organize a gig you know yeah. or they'll organize like a set you know so so it's about bringing people together and creating a sense of togetherness and identity and belonging and community and that's the opportunity to monetize and then music then becomes the kind of like but this is the reason that we love this, like, and this is what brings people in. And and I just, if I think about my own consumption of music at the moment, like a really good example is Post Malone. Like, I can't stand Post Malone's music. Like, I just can't listen to it. I can't get through a song. I love him. Yeah. I love him. And 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 I would I would listen to him all day long, like him talk <laughs> and his his views on life and the way that he approaches people and the way that he like you know connects with fans and behaves like I'm just like oh I love that you know and so I, I can be a customer and a and a and you know of his but I but I don't necessarily respond well to to the music and that's the interesting dynamic that gets created now yeah um there's there's, there's so many different routes to connect with an audience and so many different ways to do it and if you just go through the route of like create music get picked up by a label you know you know go through a publishing route and you and you lean too much into the music and actually it's about being a creative person yeah finding a community connect to connect with that you know and yeah. um does that make sense yeah no, yeah yeah and and i think the the route of kind of you being chosen and then going through a producer etc and going out to the masses is also heavily influenced 
and so as you said earlier you're making music in a way that's for the audience as opposed yeah. to how you would really want to make that music these card games are the same like you know if we want to we want to go and go to market with these games we have we have a, a number of routes but you know the two most popular routes are go to a games publisher and they'll be like you know because they're looking for ideas for games that they can jump on so that they don't have to make them themselves and they'll be like brilliant cool yeah we'll package that up we'll sell that we'll make a thousand copies we'll put them in shops da, 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 da. but you will get five percent of a yeah. sale you know yeah. and and the sale might be a fiver so if yeah. i buy that ain't a lot you know uh, or you can go down the self-published route where you go okay well i'm going to put up the cash and i'm going to do that and i'm going to go and forge the relationships and i'm going to own my own e-commerce store and do all of the seo and do all of the marketing and stuff and i'm going to own 100 percent of my sales and like and those are the kind of like that's the two ends of the spectrum and yeah. then in between is whatever you can cook up that's different and new and nuanced and innovative right yeah. um but it's the same and it applies to many industries like and I, <clears throat> just before we hit record we were talking about this because like for you and i like we can be like right I'm a creative marketing person and I can go and work for such and such company and I will get, and that company might turn over 25 million a year and they're going to give me 40 grand. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And I'm just going to turn up and press the buttons and try and be myself and so on. Or I can go and own it, you know, and I can go out and be like, no, this is how much, you know, this project is 10 grand. This project is five. This one I'll do for free. This one, you know, and just like, I get to own that. And then like how much I make, it's kind of like is basically comes down to my audacity <laughs> to be like yes. it's this much you know and yeah. and yeah. To, you know, and and to create something that's valuable so this dynamic exists across every industry and i think this is the thing that that i'm like i'm trying to convey to more and more and more people all the time is that the this co the concept of creative freedom is the thing that unlocks that wherever you go mm. and people you know when people talk about creativity they're like well, i'm not a creative person i can't play bassoon or i can't paint you know or whatever <laughs> it's not, yeah but creativity isn't about isn't about sort of the classic traditional art but creativity is about just making something that didn't exist before yeah. you can do that as an accountant you can make things you can make money work you know you can do that as a librarian you can do that as a like there's so many different ways of bringing making like if you just think about making what do you make not what do you do what do you make and if you can keep leaning into that and it unlocks things and then like okay well now I have a clear idea of what I make how do I now create a sense of freedom and agency and autonomy around that so that I can just choose what it is that I make and then I go and find the people that are interested in buying that thing yeah it's, it's so true and your book is called make it as well so that ties in it's yeah. like how amazing is that <laughs> it's interesting I've just thought of something I wanted to probably tell you about because if we were having a virtual cuppa which we sort of are Toby um I wanted to tell you about some work that I've got which is going to happen in August hmm. and this is interesting because this almost taps into what you've said I think in that I have created Live It, Love It, Sell It, as you know, in the concept and methodology that I have. And that was very much me putting all of my stuff into what I'd... Yes, you've got the book. If you're watching on YouTube, Toby... like four Toby's... copies of the bookshelf. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Get, giving back. them out in the yeah. hope you might I've read got, it. I've even got two, or two different editions. <laughs> <laughs> you've got one of the originals. That might be worth a lot of money in the future, Toby. <laughs> you never know. Um. But when I created the book, it was all about me really wanting to, to do something different around sales. I, I hated how traditional sales had been put into the world mm -hmm. with fear mainly. This August, I'm going to be in Budapest. You're going to love this. And I am delivering the sales module for an MBA for the Central European University. Amazing. And isn't it? And I'm like, how has this even happened? I am not out there promoting myself as an academic teacher of sales. How has this happened? Anyway, when this guy came to me through LinkedIn, I said to him, how have you found me? Why have you chosen me? Because I think this is another thing. Let's ask, because that's really interesting then to find out. And he literally said, we're looking for something different in the way we produce our sales module. Mm. We don't want what we've always done. We wanted something different. I watched your YouTube, I looked at your content and I felt like actually it was really interesting the way you were presenting sales. 
Mm. And that won me a really nice piece of work, which is in Budapest, which is even more exciting because I've never been. But how amazing is that? Isn't that a great example of me putting out what I want to creatively and somebody mm. seeing it and saying, yes. I'm a big fan of just making and sharing and making and sharing and not having too many plans, you oh. know, and because, um, and, and, you know, other people will have more success their plans than me but like I just feel like whatever I plan the opposite happens you know and <laughs> the best things that have happened come about because someone just goes oh hey I was just thinking of you you know and like so the more that you can be out there and be someone that people can just sort of see and think about the more you'll and the more open you are to someone just going oh have you thought about this and you just could be like do you know what no I haven't tell me more you know yeah. where it's just kind of like it, it, it's and, you know, I've got this sort of, I've got friends that kind of like, you know, have very clear offerings, you know, and I think it's great to have a clear offering. Um, and, and I think that's a good business practice and so on. And I know like the different businesses that I have and have run, like having that clear offering is good. But as an individual, you need to be ready to respond to opportunities that you haven't thought of. Definitely. That's that's so, so true. You know, so true. I mean, I'm more some other work I've been doing is around leadership and customer experience. And to be honest, Toby, everything I do in my sales stuff translates into those worlds as well. You know, and this is about the having the courage sometimes to say, yeah, I want to bring my my experience and I want to bring my thoughts yeah. to your projects, you know, because I, I, I can fit them in there. It's, it's beautiful. Um. I want to probably then uh, bring this on to TEDx because mm. I think it probably comes into TEDx. It quite, flows does. in quite nicely. Um, you've obviously been curating for, I think you said about eight years now, but when you first started, you were uh, doing the exhibitions. I remember you saying, uh, yeah, I was uh, sorting out the exhibition stands and I thought maybe there's something big going on behind those yeah. doors. <laughs> first two years, I didn't even go and watch the talks, didn't even know what they were. <clears throat> But then Ted wasn't a thing then. It wasn't so it wasn't cool. It wasn't interesting. It was just kind of like this, this kind of like social brand thing that people were playing with and like and it had a little sort of cult following, but that's not yeah. why people were interested. People were interested because there was something local going on and it was, you know, it was kind of like, oh, that person that I know that runs that project or that company or that charity is speaking at this event. I'll go and have a look, you know. So the, the groundswell was di very different and ted was not you know ted 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 was like a bit of a sort of techie nerd conference and yeah. just working out how to how to bring it in we've gone through this kind of like transition of like you know when i first started it it felt more like a b2b event and that was my background as well so i was treating it like a b2b event whereas like we're trying to get professionals in and we're trying to get businesses in and that's where the ticket sales are and and now like it's 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 it, it undeniably a consumer event yeah. you know people are coming as themselves you know as a parent as a you know as a as a just a citizen or a civilian you know and just sort of going okay well how do I and, and they see the world changing and they see challenges and they see opportunities and they don't know what to do with them and they see a potential in themselves that they don't feel ready or prepared or confident or get permission enough to do something interesting with and 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 TEDx now gives people power and agency to, to to go. Oh, you know, this idea that I have, you know, with this way of doing it, and then that, you know, and that person that had that confidence to do that, and they plug little bits together, and they go, oh, and then they're the last bit of the puzzle, and then they're like, oh, I have the power to do something really cool and exciting that can make a difference in the world, and and that's the that's the magic of it that I've. That I've, that I've that I've just come to learn over time and at this particular moment in time it's never felt clearer that that's the purpose of the work yeah. is, 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 is to just it's, just it's not about this person is giving this talk and it's going to inspire mm. these people to do this thing it's about here's an idea here's a thought here's an experience here's a story and each person in the audience is drip 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 drip, drip until yeah. they have a cup and that cup is now theirs to do something exciting with. Yeah, yeah. And just talking about being in the audience, in 2019, I was in the audience. I did my talk in 2018. 2019, I was in the audience. And having sat in the audience the year following the, when I was actually on the stage, I honestly can say that day changed me. You know, it, it did. Just being in the audience for that day in the Brighton Dome changed me changed how I maybe thought about some stuff, uh, changed my opinions, changed um, 
my emotions, I think, sometimes, you know, you walk out of TEDx, especially, I think, Brighton, because it is such a beautiful venue. It's so well curated and it's also this big audience. You know, you're in this, you're you're in this world for the day, aren't you? The ocean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really quite something. Until you've experienced it, you, you don't necessarily understand why I'm talking about it in this way, but it is that. And so I go again this year and so excited. You know, I'm taking my partner with me this year. I know he loves, you know, he loves people and opinions and the world. So he's just going to love TEDx. But for you, having done it all of these years and eight of those years, you curated it, Toby. And interestingly, what you said in the last podcast was about the fact that you needed to see people who had an amazing story, but they had to come out of the other side of that story and they weren't still stuck in the trauma of that story. So therefore they could offer the audience something, you know, that was, yeah, that was such a great I, way to explain it. I definitely still believe that's true, but I don't think it's necessarily how I approach it anymore. And interesting. And it, yeah. And and I've I've taken a big journey away from storytelling and into the which is something and now this is more and this is more within the spirit of TED, which is the ideas worth sharing and and it's taken me a long time to 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 complete that journey of of realizing what it what it is and what it's not, um and and I think how it's perceived by a, a wealth of people on the outside as well. It's like, this is a, you know, and people come to me like, I would like to do a TEDx talk. And like, okay, cool. And they're like, I've got a story that is da 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 And I'm like, I don't care about your story. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, it, it, it's not actually, it's not actually as useful and as relevant and as impactful to the audience as, 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 as it has been to you. Because it's yours. Mm. Like, you mm. own it. You know what the impact is. Yeah. The audience have their own stories. And what they're looking for is puzzle pieces that help complete the next chapter of that story so they can move into the next chapter. So, so <clears throat> and so they're not looking for someone to come and blow their minds so they can be like, oh my God, I'm going to do what that person did, like, which is what perhaps I used to see it as. It's just yeah. kind of like, you know, and the advice I used to give to speakers was just like, just come up and tell your story, which is like nice. And it's like, it, it's, it's appreciative of the journey that they've been on and so on but really it's it, really what it comes down to now for me is is there a is there a change that somebody feels must happen in the world you know and we're heading down this this motorway that's taking us to quite a risky threatening scary place mm we can't find a turning off then you know that th th there is peril <laughs> yeah. and and if we if we can find the turning off if we can change a belief change a behavior change a narrative change a you know a, 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 a thought like you said you've changed opinions you changed emotionally you changed you know that's what we're looking for mm. is kind of like and if you can just tap 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 over the course of the day with yeah with stories with music with ideas with performance like all of this stuff comes together to sort of create this this idea of a change so the first question that i get tried to get under the skin with new speakers is now is what are you trying to change people's minds about mm. and then if i can get to under the skin of that then i can be like okay well what's the fork in the road moment that you're going to show the audience yeah. so it's kind of like you're going down this we're all heading down this road what's right what what does what does going what does going down the other road look like yeah. and what opportunity does that create and what risk does it mitigate and if we can get that distilled in an idea and then if i can get enough of those ideas that all create you know the lots of the little forks in the road that then can accumulate to actually changing the journey of community society civilization and so on we get to create something that's vastly bigger than the sum of our parts and yeah. I think that's the power of it now. And that's my that's my journey of discovery with this and how it's useful. And that's I think that's why. And I think that's what Ted aims to do as well. They don't communicate it that way very clearly to, to the masses, but when they work with us, they do. And so so I've over time just adjusted TEDx Brighton to be more like that. And then I think that's why it kind of, you know, it is a bit different to, you know, I'm, I'm sure lots of people have watched Ted. Dex talks on YouTube and maybe even been to TEDx events and stuff. Brighton is a different beast. Like it, it, it looks the shape and size of it is different to most TEDx events. The culture and the 
community aspect of it is different. Like we've created something, we've accidentally created something quite different. Um, and I think a lot of it comes down to kind of like, yeah, we want to we want to nudge our community in a different direction and see yeah. what happens. Uh, this it's amazing uh, just talking about it in this way I love it I also wonder if because of the part of the country you're in because Brighton is essentially this real hub I think of mm -hmm. innovation and and um, open-mindedness you know there's there's something very special about Brighton I I think living in Milton Keynes mm. in the center of the country nowhere near the sea and and it's almost an anonymous place here, very anonymous. It's mm. beautifully curated, but it's anonymous. Coming to Brighton always feels so very different. Is it partly because of being in Brighton that you've been able to achieve yeah. these great events, <clears throat> do you think? Brighton has its own thing. I mean, one of the things that I've just sort of started to get a feel for, and I think this is something that we're probably all conscious of anyway is that people are just desperate for something different at the moment like I think there is this there is a there is a uh, a political and social apathy at the moment that, that that is just washing across you know and that will you know and that's down to you know the politics of things like you know, the division that Brexit created the you know the economic climate that Covid created the sense yeah. of community that got created but then taken away from us through Covid as well you know the current sort of sense of um you know war and people and, and then how that's affecting things like migration and things like there's just, there's just so much going on that that makes people go oh my god like how do we just find something different like and how do we find the people that are going to help us create that different world as well mm. and one of the reasons that like my mum always says this about TEDx she's just like oh it's just when you live in this world where there's all these things that are just constantly this is hard this is horrid this is hard this is horrid like to just sit there for six seven hours and just let positivity and hope and optimism wash over you and just see examples of that living in the world you're just like oh okay right we've got a chance like we can get out of this like there's people leading fights that i didn't know about you know and and the, the whole theme of tedx brighton this year is got your attention you know and the sub the sub sort of text of that is kind of like change the world by changing what you pay attention to and brighton's really good at that brighton's really good at just going kind of like here's this colorful thing you didn't know you needed you know and it's <laughs> history as a city is stooped you know it's where you know, during like the HIV um, crisis, for example, like that's the reason that Brighton is, you know, has such a, a sort of rich culture of sort of gay and LGBT plus and all that sort of thing is because during the 70s and 80s, when all that crisis was taking place, Brighton was one of the very few places where people were like, yeah, you can come and wash your clothes here. <laughs> like if you've got, you know, yeah. you can come and, you know, and, the, and these, you know, the sort of clinics and things that were set up and then the way that businesses responded and the way that pubs and restaurants and clubs responded and stuff is just like of course you can come in like you know we know that it's not as scary as the as the rest of the world is making it out to be and and, th and then then before that like if you go back a few hundred years before that and you've got things like prince george and you know which is where the dome is you know it's in his power of the palace grounds of prince george and and he was the one that was going out to like asia and india and china and bringing back all these wonderful things and you know, there's a giraffe that lived in the gardens in brighton for a bit do you know what i mean like and it's just like what <laughs> You know, and it's like the culture of Brighton is one of like of, of of showing up and going, here's something weird that you didn't know that you liked, you know. And so that's and that's where that stuff starts to show up. And then when sort of business and charity and innovation and social impact and stuff starts to become more visible and prevalent, you know, we get that becomes a tool for us to exercise that. So and, and when you have events that then come together and try and capture that, you know, all you're doing is shining a light on the good stuff that's going on. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense because. It is about that community thing again. You know, we, we mm. come back to this so often in our chats, don't we, Toby, about community? Yeah. And what everything you've just talked about is based on community, you know, and, and Brighton has this beautiful way of creating their community, I think. But I've, I've always seen our job, when I'm thinking about like picking themes and topics and things, the, 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 the language that I've now fallen into is like being a mirror to the community. Yeah. And... So it's a bit like soaking up what's going on and then trying to play that back in a way that just sort of like gives the audience. And it's not about giving them a theme like, you know, to pick speakers or stories around, but it's about giving them a frame to look at the stories and the ideas through. And yeah. and just by giving them a, a theme, which for me is actually more about giving them a, a frame. 
And that frame, you know, is a mirror. It's a frame for a mirror. It's not a frame for a picture. It's a frame for a mirror. And so you're just shining the audience back to themselves. It used to come from a place of kind of like, here's these like 15 people with all this power to inspire, you know, and so on. And if we can just pass on and transfer a bit of their power to you, then maybe you can go and do something cool too. Whereas my mind has switched with this now. And it's like, no, the audience has power like they come into the room and they are a powerful community collection of people and they already have power now what they're looking for is that power to be debated so you know the person on stage doesn't have power to share they just have their own they do they're on their own journey and for this moment in time they're just showing you like a version of that journey that you can mm. look at and if you can again it's like speaker by speaker story by story idea by idea the audience gets to complete their sort of power puzzle if you like and maybe there's just two or three pieces missing and once that comes together it's like some sort of something from a superhero movie where they connect all the pieces together and it becomes a powerful thing and the audience already has the power it's about sort of sparking it and giving it permission giving it it, it a, di a direction to travel in yeah and then they get to see a part of themselves that they had forgotten or didn't know that was there or don't have not given permission or appreciation to that then creates the thing and they're like do you know what that food project that i've been wanting to do <laughs> can't do it. you know and 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 it, it was always there it was always their idea it was always theirs thing to create and they always had the power to do it now they just have like a step to take permission to to, to let in and so on tell me about when you changed your thought process around TEDx well interestingly like I mean COVID gave us all time off and it definitely gave us time off from TEDx and you know that was the time where I started leaning more into teaching and working you know I've always done youth work but I've always just sort of shown up and waved my hands and hoped that it was exciting you know and then becoming more strategically involved with our with the charities you know with 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 the uh, hummingbird project which is our refugee charity and then we've got the i'm the i'm the chair of the trustees at the moment for the brighton youth center which is a big youth center in brighton and then and then going into an educational setting as well and that's teaching adults but young adults and so on and like and just starting to see like hey i'm spending my every day now i'm in spaces where there are people that have amazing experiences have amazing ideas have lots of creativity and art to offer have lots of you know and in like the so like in the you know in our hummingbird and the refugee charity you've got these people that have just been on the most just unimaginable journeys and have overcome the most awful oppression and so on and it takes such strength to get through that you know and to lose family in your home and then to spend two years walking across continents and stuff like it takes so much you know so then so there's already power there and now it's about going okay now you found a home now you found a community let's let's put that power to work let's give you something you know let's or let's let you let's help you discover the thing that is that you want to give and so on and then working in the youth center as well it's just kind of like there's all these young people and they're in this environment that's so creative and so free then they just need little moments of channeling to give them that thing. And and then going into the music college, it's working with young people and going, I'm desperate to just get my music out, get my art out. Like I've got these things that I care about. You know, some people might care about like gender-based issues or some people might care about social or loneliness, you know, sort of things, particularly coming out of COVID. Lots of young people are like, how do we solve loneliness? You know, and, mm -hmm. and then lots of all these things that people care about and they're using music to get that out. And it's like, brilliant. Okay, cool. So, I can't give you an idea like all I can do is help you sort of like you tell me what it is and this is a consulting thing as well it's the same practice from from building brands and marketing plans and content it's just like just sitting and listening to someone for long enough and then going these five words and they're like yes, yes. And, you're like, <laughs> and it's like and they're like thank you so much it's like they're your words it's yeah. just like I just heard you said say them and then I just underlined them for you like yeah. and just sort of said if you place your saliency here does it awake the power and then they're just like yes you know so so I think actually at a practical level that's where the learning has come from it's yeah. working with people that have that that are showing up in a space youth club art school music school whatever they're there because they've got stuff to do they want to exercise that creative part of them or the exercise that part of them that 
that can bring more sort of justice or hope or optimism to others and so on. But they need someone that's that can just mirror that back and give them direction and focus or permission to be focused yeah. and be like, no, actually, I, I think if you throw yourself at that, it's going to work. And it's the same with TEDx, you know, and the best yeah. TEDx speakers, are the ones that are just doing so much stuff, particularly at this stage we're at, where we've got a couple of weeks to go. Like most people are getting to that point now where they're trying to craft the last 60 seconds of their talk you know and, and actually just before this meeting with you I had a you know coaching session with one of our speakers and the thing that I said to her is just kind of like she's like I, I, I'm just really struggling with the end and I don't know why it is and I'm like would you like me to tell you why you're struggling with the end she's like, please you know like, like it's, it's because you've got three endings and you need to pick one and and she's like oh and then she looked at the script and she's like oh you're right <laughs> like I've got three endings what do I do you know I'm just kind of like well how did you start and it's just kind of like oh well I gave people this and I'm like okay well you know I gave people this question or this choice or whatever and it's like okay so which of your three endings best supports the argument that you made at the beginning yeah this yeah. one yeah okay yeah. so now you've got permission to move forward with that one like here's permission to 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 place your your attention your energy your saliency on this one thing I think it's so wonderful that they also get the opportunity to be coached as well by you in order to then create and deliver that talk that's just so lovely I, I'm so I'm so happy you do that for them because obviously everybody who knows my TEDx journey knows that Toby gave me seven days and actually Helen Packham 24 hours let me yeah. just tap into that too and um, I think one of the things for me was I just didn't have time to really think properly about what my talk would be but probably that's why it turned out as well as it did if that makes sense well just then you just got to go up and say the truth like yeah. that's all you've got at that yeah. moment that's it. Yeah. and you knew that I think when yeah. you when you asked me I think you knew that it would probably be okay because of that reason but talking about the ending of your talk remember my story with my son Sam who was 13 at the time it was him who helped me create yeah. the ending of my talk um, which was magic you know it really was lovely that that, that panned out the way well, that's it one of the things that I sort of you know this balance between ideas and storytelling and one of the techniques that I've sort of developed over the last couple of years that I'm really trying to push on our speakers this year is um, if you can get the idea and the message feeling really robust and then you keep your stories over here like I have this thing that I call the, the you know the story shoebox and you sort of capture your stories like like Polaroids, you know, and you just keep them in the box. And then once you've got the message sort of tight, you know, kind of like, what's the idea? Why is it important? How do we make it happen? Let's go, you know. Then you can start bringing in and out stories. And it's yeah. just like, if I bring in a 10% of this story here, like, does it help bring that idea to life? Does it lift it? Does it give it energy? And one of the things that I like, keep finding myself repeating over and over and over with this is like, one of the gifts that gives you is its flexibility. You want to have flexibility to tell stories, you know, so you might have been planning to tell the story that happened you know, to you 20 years ago at the end of the thing. And then on the train, on the way there that day, you might meet someone or hear something or see something or just read something in a paper or something. And you want to have the flexibility in your talk to then go, oh, that's such a better story than the one I have. <laughs> I have to tell it. And that has to be a completely effortless hot swap. You know, just yeah. kind of this thing that happened to me six hours ago, I have to tell you all about yeah. because it's such a wonderful sort of analogy or, or or piece of evidence for the idea that I'm trying to share with you. That that is that is real magic. And it's also a skill, Toby, because some people have to be so prepared and rigid and structured when they're doing a, a, a talk or a mm -hmm. speech that they can't go away from what they would planned to say. So it's a real skill, isn't it? To be able to actually suddenly say, oh, and by the way, this happened. Let me tell you about it. You know, it's a lovely skill to have, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I hopefully, you know, this is one of the things that I've done year and year and year. And, I, and I'm sorry that we couldn't create the same experience for you. But it's like just spending more time with the speakers and getting them to spend more time with each other as well. Yeah. And every year that goes by, I just look for more and more opportunities to just create more time together yeah. uh, because it ultimately it creates a better day it creates a more coherent narrative across the day 
and the more visibility that speakers have of what else is going on and so on they can they can work together to be like yeah. oh well if you're gonna say that and you're going on you know three slots before me and then I so then if I say that maybe the order you know and it gives and one of the other things I'm finding with people at the moment is just like spend less time justifying yourself yeah like, like don't tell this story about how you built this and how you created that and da, 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 just so that the audience then believe you when you say this is how we fix this problem just get up there and tell them that this is how you fix the problem like exactly. and, and trust the audience to kind of like be able to put all the puzzle pieces together and be like do you know what like I think that's how we fix the problem <laughs> you know? how long now do you think you're going to continue to do your TEDx Brighton yeah, it's it's it, it's got a it's got a different life to it at the moment. Like, um, there's some energy to it that 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 feels new at the same time. Like the there has to be, you know, diversity of thought and experience around the people that build this thing in order to make sure that it retains its relevance. So it can't just be the Toby Show forever. Do you know what I mean? But which is one of the reasons that I'm also trying to create a new, you know, sort of launching new events and things at the moment, so that I can start to live out my ideas. Uh, with more agency as well you know and start to play with the formats and play with you know the people and, and and so on and change the way that people interact with some of the ideas that I find important yeah so if I find new and exciting ways of bringing those thoughts and feelings to life then maybe my journey with TEDx sort of starts to sort of sort of end more naturally and sooner mm. Mm. but at the same time I sort of feel like um there's a new life coming to it at the moment and I can see you know this whole thing about you know just even just sort of arriving at the the conclusion that the audience has the power and we're just giving them permission to step into it like yeah and that's something that I've believed in, in working with individuals and young people for a long time and now I'm working out how to scale it into larger audiences and you know now that I know that I want to exercise it because I feel like that's the opportunity to create bigger bolder social change so I don't want to waste that opportunity either no so, and, and I yeah. feel just talking to you today about TEDx how different it is and how you have this new energy and this realization and and as you'll say to me it's not just Toby because even my experience will tell the audience right now that it's a whole team of people who are truly amazing who produce that TEDx in Brighton aren't they Toby yeah yeah it's a special team yeah very special very special listen it's been really great to talk about TEDx in in that way because yeah. uh, you know we've actually gone into some other layers of it I think haven't we if yeah. uh, anyone's listening and they've still got time to go and there's any tickets left then I can't recommend it highly enough and I'm excited to see you on the 5th of April Toby at TEDx this year I can't wait to see you I hope you're going to be there for a big hug. Um, is there anything else that you want to leave the audience with just as a final thought? Because what's been lovely about today, I think, is the way we've talked about creativity, you know, mm. that um, being able to really express who you are in, in what you create and what you do. Um, and also this kind of the way the audience, I love this power in the audience uh, scenario now that you talk about with TEDx and equally with all the other work you've been doing. I think we mm. all have that power, really. Mm. It's just about whether we are working with the people who can make us realise that, isn't it? I think you just kind of nailed it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the who are you working with? And my business partner, Fox, he, he has this saying, I think he might have pitched it from somewhere, but it's just like whenever we're struggling with something, he goes, he goes, let's ask who not how you know and and it's like right so if we're struggling with this thing like who do we need help with or like if we've got this thing to offer but no, but but it's not quite clicking like are we just do we just need to rethink who we're offering it to and so on and yeah. as I'm starting to reshape my career at the moment and just going through the sort of next chapter of that it's a big part of that I'm sort of realizing that if I look back over the last 10 years the happiest moments have come from being aware of who I'm spending time with not how much I'm charging them yeah. to spend time with them and 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 it is you know we alluded in the sort of in the precursor to hit and record like it's that kind of you can get so sort of sucked up in that kind of like oh but they want to pay me this much you know it's yeah. like yeah but they're assholes and they're irritating they keep moving the goalposts and yeah. I've lost my sense of identity and that's and that comes back down to what's the path of least regret mm. and 
the path of least regret in my experience comes from like you know choosing the right people to be around yeah and those people will create the opportunities with you but if you can prioritize being in the room with the right people you know that give you something and you give them something and as long as you're clear on what your value is and just to sort of be mushy and sentimental for a moment like even just my sort of own mental health journey I think over the last you know sort of 12 to 24 months the the, the points where I found myself most unhappy is where I've not been clear or I've not felt valued by other people mm. and that stems from not knowing my own value myself and there have been times where I've been sort of like you know in the last few years where like you know I've had a nice string of like good 10k months or something like that and it's just like but why am I not happy <laughs> yes, yes. and it's like because it's an asshole giving you the money like and and you don't you don't believe in their journey so why on earth should should you believe in your own yeah. and when when I'm around the right people and there's you know when I'm around people that are just kind of like oh Tobes that's so cool that thing you're doing and like you know just even like sharing these board games and like and then people are like wow that's so cool I'm like yeah it is like <laughs> that just adds fuel to the tank that allows me to yeah. go out and kick ass wherever I'm going you know whether it's a corporate thing or a playing games thing like yeah. you know yeah. exactly and I've experienced that recently with some of the things I'm now working on and doing you know and the realization is exactly the same Toby yes I'm going to get my money from that corporate market there's no question in that and mm. they'll hire me and they'll have a brief for me and actually they won't support me to meet that brief usually but <laughs> I'll do my damn best to do yeah. that um, they'll come back then feeling undervalued not in a place where I'm giving out the best Jules White, you know, version. And alongside it, I've just started a new little business of my own, which I'll share when the time's right. And to be honest with you, it makes my heart sing. It brings me huge joy. And I know that was the little bit that was missing out of my puzzle. And so, you know, it, it is about finding that thing, I think, that makes you super happy and if you need to run it alongside making some money somewhere else, go for it. But remember mm. what really, really makes you happy, because I think that's that's super important. So you're completing your power puzzle. <laughs> yes, my power puzzle. <laughs> Heard it here first. Yeah. Yes, you did. Toby, it's always a pleasure to chat to you. We don't do it often. Dream to talk to you. <laughs> but thank you for being my guest on the human conversation today. I almost forgot we were making a podcast because I always do when we chat. <laughs> um, yeah. But listeners, I hope you've enjoyed the amazing insights of our Toby. And it, there's a lot of food for thought in there, actually, in this episode. So do listen to it and do absorb it and actually make some changes because of it. Why not? We're not here on this earth very long. Let's make some changes. I'm going to see you at TEDx, so I can't wait for that. And listeners, if you're listening and you enjoy our human conversation, then we're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we'll be on YouTube because you're going to be able to see Toby's beautiful face on YouTube as well. Tune in. Tune in next time to the human conversation. We'll see you soon. Ta-ta for now. You've just been listening to the Human Conversation podcast with Jules White. To find out more about the other work that Jules does, please visit her website, www.liveitloveitsellit.co.uk. And if you enjoyed the podcast, then please do leave a rating and review on the platform you use to enjoy her show. Thanks for listening and see you next time.